just in events management. And since I opened my own firm, more of the intersection between events uh, and the overall development program and making sure events are doing what they were designed to do, which is move um, donors along the pipeline and not just get them to go to an event year after year. But I want to reserve time for questions, so let's jump in. <laughs> well, let's let's get started with some um, starter sort of starter. We'll introduce the topic, and then we'll get everybody to chime in with questions. And the beautiful thing about this group that um, I don't know. If I mentioned I've been doing now for I don't know since COVID started so 12 weeks maybe more I, I lost count I don't know um, and the beautiful thing is I set it up as a town hall so sometimes when there are questions like Gail is throwing out the first question I'll just start with it and I'm gonna let you answer it but then everybody on the call also weighs in on the in the chat box so she says are there any virtual platforms you would recommend for virtual gala and silent auctions? This you you expected this question, I right? This, this question <laughs> is the one that I feel like should be asked as the last question because there are so many questions you have to ask before you decide on what the technology is. Um, you really have to think about, like anything, what your primary goal is and choose a technology that helps you accomplish that. For example, I have some clients or I've heard of groups where their number one priority is to make sure the in-person networking feels like it's in person. Mm -hmm. So they will choose a platform, you know, at a simplistic level like a Zoom where people can engage one or one on one or some of these platforms that allow you to have a gala table. Um, like, uh, uh, I think they pronounce it Remo is what I've heard of, um, Shindig, um, where people can have that real in person networking. For others, they want it to work very well with their auction. So you might choose like an auction technology and just stream to your website via um, like StreamYard or um, I forget, uh, what's the other one? Sorry, I took some notes, uh, StreamSpot. Um, so yeah. that's, where the, where, that's where the crowd's gonna come in. They're gonna know what you're trying to say and they're gonna fill it in in the chat. So it's just a matter of time before someone goes, is it this or is it that? So um, while Stephanie's finishing answering, you guys, if you use a platform for your gala or your auction, um, start to fill it in. What have you tried? What, what, and say, of course, if you love it or if you hate it, because we want to yeah. know that too. I would say more than ever before, this is not the time to look at one or two vendors. I would go out to five or six. This is not the time to say, oh, they sounded okay on the phone um, because I've already heard many nightmare stories. So you definitely want references in this specific time and place doing what you want done versus just like we've been around for 10 years because a lot of companies are repurposing for this COVID-19 pandemic environment so even though they may have had a great track record in their standard product if they've made any adjustments you'll want to make sure you get a reference Oh, and so I, I, it's evolving very quickly. What was offered a month ago is different than what's being offered this month and will be different again by September, October. So I would keep checking with vendors and talk to as many as possible because you'll also learn what questions to ask. Uh, excellent. Um... Yes, so oh, Susan's asking, is everyone on all panelists and attendees? So no, I don't think I can automate them. They have a choice who they're, text, who they're chatting with. So you guys, um, if you want everybody to see your response, you need to click down on that blue box and check um, attendees so that everybody can see your answer. Thank you, um, Susan, for reminding us of that. Um, so Stephanie, that, those are such good points. And I think, you know, it's so obvious when you say it, but honestly, 
it's so important. It bears repeating. I think really thinking about what is your purpose or what's your goal, I think is the word you used before selecting your technology. So, you know, right. It's not just about any old auction or all auction, silent auctions or live auctions are the same, but what do you want the outcomes to be? What are you going to do with the technology or not the technology, but the data afterwards, um, and how are you going to follow up? So I think that that's really smart. Um, all right, so let's let's start. Let's take a step back a little bit, and really, you know, in March and April, when everything was shutting down and blowing up, you know, people went to virtual and online events out of necessity. It was sort of like they had a week or maybe a day or maybe two weeks to make the decision. But now that people are thinking about their fall events, should they be going virtual? How are they supposed to make those decisions? What, the, what criteria are you using? How are you guiding people? So I'm happy we're in this environment because there have been a few trends over the last five years that I think this situation has brought to a head. Um, and the best way I can explain it is that before I appeared today, I jotted down a bunch of notes because this isn't the typical talk I give. You know, I've been in events for almost three decades now, and I'm like, I know what I usually say pro forma. It's, I don't need a script, I can just make it up as I go. But I, there were things I wanted to remember to say, and I think it's a perfect microcosm of where we are in events. This is the time to actually make sure your strategy is meeting your organizational goals and you're not just doing the same old, same old because your organization has always done it for 10 years or 20 years or 50 years or, yeah. or two years. So now is the time to think about whether or not your event is a good fit for your development program. Um, there's a couple of trends that have been going on. Um, almost every client who calls me now um, for the last five years has talked about how to use their event as a way to build a major gifts program because that was the direction they felt they needed to go in, whether their major gift was $1,000 or $100,000. Mm -hmm. So this is a good time. Like events aren't necessarily a good model for making that transition. So you really want to look at what type of donors you have and who you're attracting. If you're an event that brings in, you know, that sells tickets for a hundred dollars a pop, maybe you don't need the event at all. <laughs> maybe you can do a digital strategy to bring in way more hundred dollar gifts than getting someone to come drink uh, the wine that you had to get donated in the space you had to get donated because you couldn't afford an event. If your average donor is a hundred thousand dollars, maybe an event isn't the strategy for them either. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think it, this is a good opportunity to step back and think about those types of things. Are there other types of fundraising programs that should replace your event? Because we've been hearing for almost 10 years now that the event model is dead or dying, um, mainly based on shifting corporate trends, um, competition had already entered the marketplace when i got into events 20 years ago there was you had competition but it wasn't the same like now we are competing whether you are a nonprofit in new jersey you're competing with someone's gofundme in brisbane <laughs> someone's you know facebook page in canada mm -hmm. and people in kentucky as well there's just so much fundraising going on across every channel. Um, so people really had to think about who their audience was. And I think this gives us an opportunity. Um, it also gives us an opportunity. Um, the second most requested or the, the issue that people have brought up the most in the last three to five years is our event is at a horrible time for us, but that's when it always was scheduled for, <laughs> you know, like, but no one wanted to lose that fiscal year to shift their event. This is a perfect opportunity to think about how to 
an event is one time and place. You can still do an online virtual event, but it doesn't have to be limited to that day in time. You could play it out over weeks, months, whatever. The event could be the kickoff for like a campaign, if you will, where you can take all this great content you have, repackage it in smaller video bites and play it out. And that could be a good way to shift your event. Um, I've now forgotten the original question. <laughs> basically, basically. This is a time to really step back and strategize because the sky's the limit. We will never have an opportunity like this again to sort of reshape how we're doing things. And we're, we'll have to live with this for a while, I think. So uh, a lot of people are asking me, like, should we schedule our spring event? Um, and the truth is nobody knows, but you have to do some scenario planning and think about, what your strategy is, how much money you need to bring. Maybe you can't afford to wait into the spring. Maybe you have to do a fall campaign just in case. And you want to think about what your competition will be because in the spring, this past spring, it was very easy to do a virtual event. Everyone was in lockdown in most states, not all states, <laughs> in, our, in our area of the world. We were home and I'll try not to get political. Um, and, um, so we were home and frankly, people had nothing else to do. except Like I was on webinars, I was taking online classes. If we don't know what's gonna happen in the fall or the spring, if people could be out, Will they stay home to watch your event if they, if school closed? So we just have to have various scenarios and I think start thinking about an event not as a fixed point in time, but as a part of a strategy. Yeah, I, first of all, you answered the question perfectly because it was about, you know, in the, in the spring, we had no time to plan. Everything went virtual. We didn't have time to think. But now for fall and certainly next spring events, we actually have time to strategize. And obviously we should be strategizing. You should be planning. And having you know an A and a B scenario might be a wise thing to do as well. But I think the reality is you're so right. I've gotten so many questions and I'm not even in events or event planning about should we plan our event for the spring or the fall? Nobody knows, right? Will I want to be in a room with a hundred people anytime in the near future? No way. And I think, you know, most people probably at this point feel the same. And so um, what are you going to do that's different? But I love your idea about having the event, um, you know, sort of a kickoff for event, the events, the kickoff, and then the campaign runs or on the other, on the flip side, you can be raising money up until a celebration and that's the event, right? So raising money for weeks or months up until the event, um, you know, whether it's a virtual 5k or a, a non, you can have non events. I mean, I've, I don't know what you think of this, Stephanie, but I've been encouraging organizations to call their event donors and say, listen, we're not having the event this year. Will you contribute? <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that's good or bad on its own. It depends on your audience. And <laughs> um, definitely reaching out to donors now is good. This is the time to get data. So if you have close-in people, find out how committed they are to that event. Maybe, I mean, if you have the same event audience year after year, I would almost say, why do you have an event? That's not the purpose of them. <laughs> um, I used to tell clients all the time, it is not a fundraising win to get the same person to buy a $10,000 table for five years in a row. Like, <laughs> it's okay, but like that's not fundraising. <laughs> fundraising is who of those $10,000 donors can you move up or get them involved in some more significant way? What is their potential? How can you help them come to other decisions? So I'm an event planner, sort of. And I mean, I guess <laughs> I think of myself as a fundraiser, but, um, but sometimes I say, you know, when I got in this field, events were not as prevalent as they are now. People have started adopting them 
because they were a really easy way for a time to bring in unrestricted income. That time has passed a little bit and you have to put in so much time and effort to put a good event together that that time and effort might be better spent in another way now that we have the choice. And maybe you just try other strategies for a year and get back to your event later. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to tell you, because I know you're not looking at the chat box, that you're getting a shout out from a, one of your clients, Cynthia Reese in Cleveland, Ohio, is saying hi, and she's excited to hear all of your wisdom. So, um, our, instead of Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, all right, let's see. Um, you know, we've gotten some suggestions or people are trying out. I don't know that they've found that they're good or they're bad yet, but somebody says, Jennifer says she's trying lunch pool for fall luncheon. Um, a few people have said they're trying out give butter. I don't know what that is, but um, Amy oh, right. says that she's Pretty trying good. out give butter. Uh, all right, so let's see. Um, so Christopher, I think, uh, says, what's the best way to sell a virtual event to longstanding donors who may be tired of hearing the word virtual? So I think we've sort of gone around that a little bit already, um, and maybe it's not having the virtual event at all. But Stephanie, do you have anything else to add in terms of um, sort of, he's using it's sell in quotes, selling your virtual event to longstanding donors. Give them a break. Don't make them come to an event, right? <laughs> well, I, um, I, I think what Christopher is, um, the second half of the question is perhaps the better one. Again, in the spring, audiences were willing to go along with just about anything. Mm. Audiences have already gotten very savvy about virtual events, and the, long, the further we are from today, the more sophisticated and the more well-run your event will have to be. In April, if your image froze <laughs> while your executive director was giving comments, people didn't care because they knew everyone was adjusting, they were pivoting. If that happens in November, like forget about it, they will just click off and be done. So, um, so that's one piece of it. But in terms of selling, um, that is, I would say, one of the major differences I've seen so far. Um, sort of like the standard event perk, like we all have the same perks, right? A journal ad, you know, a better seat, um, you know, fill a listing in the newsletter, whatever it might be. And it's harder to come up with those perks and differentiators in this virtual space. Um, so I won't say I've seen anything great so far, um, but there, because most people are just planning <laughs> for the fall, um, but you can do um, some sort of VIP opportunity still, even if it's not part of the virtual event itself. Um, I have a group and we're talking about whether or not, you know, we'll provide even an in-person um, mm -hmm sort of meet and greet with the honoree um, uh, out, because I think they usually get about eight people at the highest level. So we talked about, well, eight people, maybe we can do a nice outdoor event or a more exclusive Zoom call like this where they get some sort of access. Um, other people are trying to figure out how to build in um, sort of honoree visits in rooms in virtual technology. Um, mm. What I don't know yet is whether or not what audience, like corporate audiences in particular, will see as value. Um, mm. At an event, they usually have their name, big, flashy. Um, you obviously can try and do digital things like to get their name out on social or e-blasts. Um, so that's still being worked on. Um, and then lastly, when you say sell, I'm not sure if you mean that people just don't want to go to virtual events anymore. Um, most people didn't want to go to rubber chicken dinners anymore either. <laughs> and they have a place to get out of it. And the truth is they may not which is why you really need to analyze your audience. Um, 
the, the biggest difference with virtual events is that there's not that same pressure to invite eight of your friends to go sit at that dinner table. Um, I may, I love the organization, so I may still dial in, but I'm certainly not convincing my eight friends to dial in. Um, so that's where the technology comes into play because there are groups that are dependent on that. So they are choosing technologies where I am hosting a table in my own Zoom room or whatever, um, uh, whatever technology you're using so that my guests still have that accountability and it makes me attend as well. So you'll want to think about those types of things. Yeah, great. All right, let's see. Uh, Linda's asking, what are some of the things that have gone wrong with some vendors? Uh, what should we be careful or cautious of? Any uh, cautionary tales you have so far? I think my cautionary tales are more for the planners <laughs> than the vendors, um, but I'll, I'll tackle both. Um, on the vendor side, it's all the obvious things you might expect. I've heard, um, um, and I've queried a lot of people and I've watched a lot of events. So all the typical like stalled images are, you know, the platform couldn't handle the number of people it said it could. Um, you know, it was clunky if they had a registration tie in, it was clunky to operate or the data had to be sort of transferred from one vehicle to another. Um, lack of tech support is a big problem, um, mm -hmm. both on the vendor side, but also on the uh, planner side. Um, doing a virtual event, do not do it unless you have ample tech support um, to answer those floods of emails and calls when people first log on. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, technology, oh, just poor customer service. Uh, like for example, I have a client who was trying to use a technology and they wanted to set up a demo and we called, I think six or seven times and no one got back to us. Mm. Um, so then I called someone who had recommended them to me to say, oh, like who was your salesperson? <laughs> um, and they were like, well, actually in retrospect, we had a similar issue in that um, we also didn't get calls back. Um, the, so once it went live, it was fine. But apparently 45 minutes before the show, like they had no idea if it was going to work or not work. So it also depends on your stress tolerance when you're choosing vendors. No, listen, this I would say, don't add stress to your event. If they're not picking up the, uh, the support line or the sales line or any lines, I would not use that vendor again. Yeah. Um, you know what? I, yeah, People go ahead, Stephanie. How they go treat you, and if you have a hard time in the sales process, right? <laughs> that's where they're going to be most on top of their game. So. Yeah, I, I think the most important thing to remember is that people are consistent, right? They're not going to magically get better once you've paid them. They're probably going to get worse. But people are consistent. If they don't answer the phones, if they're not helpful that's the writing on the wall. Even if it looks great online um, and you're like, oh, but it would be amazing if it did it, if that's the big, the big question, right? Yeah. Um, all right, Lisa has a good question. She says, how should I think about the budget needed to produce my virtual event? And I know there's, you know, it, it depends is the answer, but how would, you, how would you think about starting to budget? Yeah, I mean, no matter what, it's going to be more cost effective than an in-person event. Um, and I would say much in-person events, they're all over the place, right? Um, but a lot of people will chintz. Um, and the best advice I ever got was always spend money on the things that will determine the experience the guest has meaning make sure your food is good if your program is printed horribly it won't matter <laughs> you know so the same is true for virtual just make sure your technology is good no matter how much it costs because that is the thing that will keep people in or out if people have a frustrating experience and you're trying to raise money at your event they won't be there to listen to your appeal um, 
it, it just is worthwhile. The rest of it can be as fancy or as basic as you want. Um, a lot of people, since the event is virtual, are also taking their invitations and whatnot digital instead of doing mailings. Um, some are considering, some are putting more money into their mailings so that the invitation itself, uh, virtual events need to be about engagement, fun, you know, I need a reason when I could just be sitting on my couch binge watching the politician. <laughs> like, I need, I need a reason to like dial into another gala. I really do. And I'm like, I'm pretty committed. I like to go to these things and see them. Um, it's even research for work. But if I have options, it's hard. So the more appealing it sounds, the better. So I do know people are talking about. I've heard everything from like, maybe we'll use a service like Blue Apron and send people meal kits, um, which is still cheaper in New York anyway than a chicken dinner at a subpar venue. Um, <laughs> you know, all of my venue friends though, not your venues, no. <laughs> um, it, uh, uh, some people are talking about sending like, goodie bags to all the table hosts. Um, uh, so you can spend money in different places, but I would say the one place you don't want to skimp is on the technology. Hmm. That's such a good point. But I, I like this idea of, I love that idea of sending Blue Apron. I don't know if everybody wants to cook, but um, you know, one thing I've mentioned on this before, because I thought it was so fun and creative. I don't know if it's for a gala, but it might be for a, you know, a, another kind of fundraiser or something. How can you send something that's interactive, that's engaging, that everybody's doing at the same time in the same place? I'm sure I've mentioned before to this group, but my daughter had this birthday party early in the, you know, early after things shut down. And the mother actually had a bakery deliver, make your own cupcake kits to all the girls and they got on Zoom. And so they were decorating cupcakes. Um, you know, I think no matter what age you are, you might, you know, that depending on your audience, of course, you know, something. But you need to find the equivalent of that because um, the, back to, I think it was Linda's question, the biggest mistake I've seen so far are people assuming that a virtual event is their in-person event broadcast <laughs> and <laughs> you know like it it's, it's not going to work it worked in march april and may and june but you want to start thinking about it as a television show <laughs> or a, a, a production versus even a fundraiser because like just think about your own life if there was a television show on <laughs> that had six speakers sitting in their house saying this is why I support the organization it's really important to me uh, are you gonna watch that for long you might watch it for 15 minutes before you click the channel so <laughs> you need engagement interaction it's got to sound fun before I even go um, so that's the mistake I've seen the most people just thinking they can take what exists at live and put it in this forum um, and it won't work. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so, but it won't raise you a lot of money. <laughs> all right. So that's, that's a good start. We talked about, you mentioned the difference between virtual sort of online and offline invitations, um, online and offline award ceremonies or whatever the boring presentations are going to be. What are, what are some of the similarities and maybe what are some other differences? What can people replicate and what else should they definitely be doing differently. Interesting, interesting. And I feel like I'll forget so many things. I jotted down some notes, but let me try and remember. <laughs> um, okay, so what's different? Um, we talked about some of the things, uh, but you really want to think about, oh my gosh, so many things. Okay. <laughs> no, wait, no, 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 I, I have it. So, I'm just going to look at my notes. Um, yes, look at your notes. 
you know, a trend in events is about how democratic they are. In the New York market, most people can't afford to go to most of these events or like normal people can't afford to go. So now you have the opportunity for a much wider market, much wider appeal, um, already sort of this era of you know, you probably remember March and April, people were still charging people to watch the event, but that's already gone away and it's available to everybody by and large. 90% um, of the events is available to anybody. Um, so you can start thinking about who your audience is differently. There might be people in different states, different regions who could dial in and give. Um, so you have an opportunity to do some digital ads. You know, this is a time to market test a much broader audience. Um, so I suggest people try that. Um, there's, uh, you need a longer lead time to put the event together in terms of a program. Um, the good thing about that is how many of us had someone like you were leading into your auction and you thought someone was going to be a great speaker and they were horrible and your whole auction suffered because of it. You don't have to worry about that now. Like it's pre-recorded, hopefully, definitely pre-record most of your content. But that means trying to stay up late two days before the event and write the script is gone. Like you, you got to get all that stuff recorded. You have an opportunity to edit it. You can so tightly um, work that story arc because everything's recorded and you can shift things around <laughs> because I know nine times out of 10, the day after the event in the debrief, everyone's saying like, oh, I wish so-and-so had spoken before so-and-so or there was such a good message. Why didn't we do it this way? Now you have the opportunity to shape that. Um, you um, have a good, uh, oh, a good push right now if you're not sending out blue apron boxes, all, any gifts that people give are 100% tax deductible um, compared to the cost of, you know, the goods and benefits. Um, so that's something you might want to herald as um, a reason for people who used to support your event to give in a different way or a good way to market it. Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention uh, right now, Technology is cheaper than most in-person venues, but I would caution everyone, just the law of supply and demand means that that might not be the case forever. Um, everyone was caught sort of blindsided, but as more people go virtual, that price is likely to go up. Um, and I just mentioned that because it might this might be the time to lock in those contracts <laughs> and whatnot before things get too far down the uh, uh, road. Um, uh, to Amy's point, the other thing that's very different between in-person and virtual is that in person you have social pressure <laughs> to be quiet, <laughs> to pay attention, <laughs> your speaker is speaking. If they're in a crowded room, sure, there'll be those people in the back, but you know, there's some social pressure. People will turn around and say, shh, you know, there's social pressure to pay attention. You have none of that control with a virtual event. So it has to be engaging. You want to figure out some ways, whether it's polling or, um, I, I said recorded content, but maybe you want a live MC, like something to make it feel engaging so that when someone's kid runs into the room or the phone rings, like my phone just rang, it never rings, but it just rang now. If I were watching an event, I would have gotten up to get it and then I'm gone. So, <laughs> right. you know, so you, you definitely want to build in that engagement. Yeah, I think that's such a good point because I, I was working with an organization, not on their events, but on other parts of their development planning, but they were reporting out that they had just had a, I, I guess it was a happy hour as part of their virtual golf outing. And guess how many people showed up? Zero, right? It was just the staff. And, you know, 
there was no incentive for people to come. Why would they sign on for a, another Zoom meeting to go to a happy hour? I mean, it sort of doesn't make any sense unless there's going to be an announcement or prizes or a really interesting speaker. So I think that the important thing is, you know, put yourself in participants' shoes. Like, why would they want to log in? Why would they want to come? What's the motivation? What's the incentive? Um, and you want to, if you want to have a live component, um, it does have to be engaging. You do want to check with your board members and make sure that they're going to be there so that, you know, your one big donor doesn't show up with three staff members and then literally nobody else has logged on. I mean, that's, that's just embarrassing, right? Um, and so really thinking about what's the purpose of the event? If you've raised all the money in advance, do people actually need to show up? What are they going to gain from showing up? Um, you know, how can you dribble are, out or what are you going to gain from them showing up if they are <laughs> gave? Like that's a better question, maybe. <laughs> well, that's true too. All right, good. So really, really rethinking these these events. And it's not gonna be easy. What were you gonna say, Stephanie? Um, I was just gonna say related to that. So a lot of people are streaming to something like YouTube, are letting guests know that they could download and watch it later. Mm -hmm. I would just throw a caveat around that. Um, just based on my own life and you know, just anecdotal information, I have seen that if people know it will be available later, they're less likely to log in in real time because they have other things to do um there's probably going always there's always going to be something that sounds better than the, or that's more mandatory than attending one of these events so if i know i can watch it later if my phone rings right before it starts i'll take the call and say oh i'll watch it later but i never do um so just like that's just a little caveat um right so you may may not want to record it, right? Only you for may want to, but let that be a pleasant surprise after the fact that <laughs> it was so great you chose to rebroadcast. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. Good. Um, all right. So let's see. We've got several more questions. Um, I, I think that we've covered this. Kelly says, how can we ensure people participate, which we've been talking about, when there's not that in-person accountability? Um, I, I guess we've co we've covered that. Any other thing you want to say about that? The only thing I would say, just like in-person event, follow-up is key. Um, like Amy mm -hmm. said, any of these key people you want, like you need to follow up with them. Um, and I would also say in this virtual space, the lead-in should be a little different. Um, you know, I would treat it as a marketing campaign, much like a new season of a television show. Um, so for a virtual event, you'll want to send those reminders. Um, you know, I would typically maybe get one reminder for an in-person event, like 24 hours out. Um, but for a digital or virtual event, you probably want to send something a week out, three days out, two days out, one hour before. <laughs> like, right. Well, just like for this call, literally yesterday, I reminded everybody in my newsletter, they got the Zoom link 24 hours beforehand, and they got the Zoom link again to, uh, one hour beforehand. And so I think some of that standard, you have to poke people and remind people. And like um, I've been doing um, some Facebook Live events, and you know, if you're gonna stream it somewhere like that, I always put on all my social media, this just started, join now, you know, so if people forgot, um, they can see it um, and they get notified. Um, so that kind of follow-up I think is more necessary. Right, so Stephanie, I'm wondering, how do you encourage, I think in this day and age especially, um, it's gonna take creativity, it's gonna take really um, events standing out being different than the rest, you know, it's not gonna be that same old, awards event or rubber chicken dinner or golf. I mean, some of those things don't translate well to virtual. So how do you brainstorm with your clients or think about encouraging creativity or even just an example of some of the most creative things you've seen in the past few months? 
I haven't seen a lot of great things because I think people were just scrambling. Um, I think the same thing is always true. I've said this from day one. The more mission centric or the more your event ties into your mission, the more likely it is to resonate with the audience. Um, yes. More, so many people, clients, everybody will say, I saw this great thing at an event. I want us to do it. But yet all the back round fundamentals are 100% different. And I'm like, that idea won't work because <laughs> you have a different audience. You have, a, you know, so sometimes people watch these things and they say it works, but it might not work for you. So it pays to get brainstorming groups together. Definitely watch many virtual events before you plan one. I've probably watched 30 or 40 and you will soon learn <laughs> what to do and what not to do and what sort of tickles you and what seems boring, although it sounded like a good idea on paper. <laughs> um, uh, sort of a low tech uh, event I saw, uh, it, I think it was Zoom. Um, it was very early on, but they decided to do um, uh, after party dance party. So after the presentation, they had, um, I forget, oh, they had sent around a link with um, a, a live stream. They had a DJ live streaming. So everyone could uh, log in and hear the same music and you, you could uh, chat in requests for songs and the DJ would play them and then you could see everyone dancing and they were encouraged to have a cocktail. So like that was fun. Like something like that was unexpected. Um, you know, I've seen people do things like send out a recipe for a signature cocktail in advance of the event. So then everyone meets and has their glass. Um, and like I mentioned, people are just now starting to talk about sending out hard items, like whether it's a meal or a gift bag item, et cetera, before the event, um, I think those are the things, but if you think about something that works for your mission, um, brainstorm it with some stakeholders and see what makes sense for you. Yeah, I think that is a really important point for everybody to remember. You've, if you can tie it back to your mission in some way, shape or form, then that is gonna resonate significantly more with your donors than just another cocktail party or even even a dance party, you know, unless you're a performing arts center and you're doing, you know, theater, or music, or so, you know, it should be tied to the mission whenever possible. Um, you know, I'll never forget an event that we did with a domestic violence shelter, and they had people listening to 911 calls, and and um, you know, they got to they had 30 seconds to pack everything they owned. There was sort of like a mock bedroom, and you know, 30 seconds to pack your stuff in a garbage bag and leave, and that's sort of the experience that many women have. You know, they only have two minutes before, um, and so you know, that of course was like real and people People talked about it for weeks afterwards because they they experienced what it might be like to be in a domestic violence situation or have to leave or be on a 911 call or you know they heard so if you can figure out how to you know, it may not be actually simulating, um, but you know, I have heard charity water. They they carry jugs on their head. You know, what what is it like for a person to have to carry well water two miles to your home? You know, they had them carry uh, you know, fifteen gallons five feet, and people you know couldn't do it. So, what does it mean to have a well in your backyard versus you know ten miles away? Um, so those types of things. So, what can you do that actually taps into your mission and the experience of your clients, um, things like that. Yeah, um, exactly. I, would, I was just thinking, I was trying to think of an example I saw and I couldn't, but I was just <laughs> thinking, um, uh, like there's a literacy organization I work with and I thought, what, like how cute would it be? I would log in if you told me the fourth graders were going to be discussing their favorite book with like a moderator <laughs> or something. Like that would be cute. I'm 
way more likely to tune into something like that or um, get engaged by something like that than um, sort of this traditional event model of these honorees and co-chairs and board members speaking. Um, we have an unprecedented opportunity to put the program participants more forward facing than we typically do at events. Um, so I think we should take advantage of that. Yeah, so Cindy says that they did a virtual lunch luncheon and invited guests to join us for lunch and bring their pets since we were celebrating the joy pets bring to all of us. So yeah, I mean, you know, a pet parade, right? Everybody gets on and holds up their cats or their dogs, depending on what your, your mission is. I think that's a great idea. Um, all right, so Catherine's asking, how might you suggest we steward and, um, you know, thank and follow up, I guess, she says also fundraise targeting our older donors during this pandemic, since many of them are unfamiliar with Zoom um, or even not online as much. Um, do you have any thoughts or ideas? I guess it's for follow up after the event. Um, for older donors, I wouldn't make assumptions. Um, uh, what I would say instead is to build in um, an on ramp, if you would, to make <laughs> sure they're comfortable. Um, with any event, I would, a uh, virtual event, I would definitely have people test the technology in advance. Um, and what a great opportunity, like, to hold office hours, if you would, <laughs> like, where somebody meets your older donors um, virtually and helps them and coaches them through what to do, or you have a helpline set up on a specific day before the event. Um, so I wouldn't count them out. Um, I find sort of the 70 somethings are still pretty technologically savvy, at least by now. In March, not so much. Um, <laughs> the biggest problem they have, most of them are using iPads, I find, versus computers. So sometimes it appears differently. So you would just want to make sure whoever is helping, like, knows what the interface looks like on a phone. Um, iPad, laptop, and desktop. Um, mm. uh, and the first question, uh, stewardship or cultivation, or um, mm. I, I think just like an in-person event, you just want to follow up with people, get um, input, find out if they have any advice for you. <laughs> um, you know, what's the fundraising adage? If you want advice, ask for money. If you want money, ask for advice. <laughs> Um, that right. is still always true, uh, better to do in this space now because you have a valid excuse to reach out to people and solicit their feedback because this is all new for all of us um, and it's actually a gift. You can reach out to anyone right now and ask them uh, for their advice. Yeah, so, um, oh, Barbara's asking, Stephanie, you mentioned earlier about what sitting in on some virtual events to see what you like and what you don't like and what goes right and what goes wrong. So Barbara's wondering where can she find some virtual events to view? Um, so, you know, I would say that even in this community, if you have an event coming up and you're willing to give your colleagues free access so they can see what's going on, um, that would be super helpful. But Stephanie, where else should she find um, some events to view so that she can see some examples, good and bad, I guess? Yeah, um, what I do, I usually just go to YouTube and do a search on virtual <laughs> gala or <laughs> golf or whatever, and something will come up. Um, the beauty is it'll be across the world. So sometimes you can see things in other countries um, or here in the U.S., um, if you know there are major organizations in your market that have already done their events, I just go to their website to see um, what they've posted or I check their YouTube channel. Um, most of the big organizations, if you check like a Girl Scouts or a, um, a, I don't know, a Save the Children, a Better Chance, like a lot of those national organizations have all done virtual events of one sort or another. So I would just say Google all of them. <laughs> okay. And in the, in the chat, Courtney's um, sending, sharing a link to their virtual event. So that's great. Thank you, Courtney, for sharing that. I'm sure others will, whether it's 
this week or next week or in the in the near future I so that you can talented I would go to my email and post some in the chat but <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, but I think that it's a good idea to go to YouTube. Also going, you know, asking your colleagues and, and other events or other organizations that are in your community say, you know, we'd love to get some ideas or see what's going on. Some will share, some won't. Um, all right. So we're getting towards, towards the end of our time. So Stephanie, I wanted to know, you know, what takeaways you want to leave everybody with um, in terms of thinking about virtual events, I mean, you've shared so many amazing tips already, but how should people, you know, what, what, are your, what are your best takeaways? If somebody was a new prospective client or a new client of yours, what would you be telling them? How much time do we have? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, your key takeaways. <laughs> takeaways, I think um, definitely, making sure your virtual strategy is meeting whatever goals and objectives you have for your fundraising program and not just assuming you have to keep the same thing because it's always been a certain way. Um, thinking about your event as a production versus like an in-person event, um, I think is a key mindset shift and will change what it looks like, um, what you focus on, and where you put your dollars. Um, I would say uh, key takeaway, <laughs> check, check, double check, all references, um, really put all of, so much of your time into choosing who that vendor will be, but also realize that I don't think there's any perfect vendor right now, so you just have to make sure uh, you know, uh, you want to divide it up into your must-haves and your like-to-haves and make sure your must-haves are all being taken care of. Um, and then I think putting yourself in the seat of the audience and making sure that you are creating something that you yourself would want to <laughs> participate in um, and thinking about who your audience is and how it relates to what your goals are because you know I always say if it's only your board members and your regular donors showing up you could probably send them a letter <laughs> and get all the same gifts so like you really want to ask yourself is this the best use of our time and that was always true with in-person events um, Online events are more time consuming in the sense that most of us are relearning everything we thought we knew. Um, so there is no more turnkey event, you know, as a firm, when I, you know, I would have a client five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years, like by year three, it was pretty easy. Like you look for some changes or, you know, some of the fundamentals change, but a lot of it was turnkey. Right now, nothing is actually turnkey. So you want to make sure that the ROI is worth it. Um, and last, Stephanie. oh, sorry, oh. I didn't mean to cut you off. Get one, one second before you get to your last point. I'll make people hang on that last word. Don't forget it. Write it down if you need to. I but let me let me type in the chat. Um, where can people find you if they want to ask you follow up questions or if they want to hire you for their upcoming virtual event? Or um, uh, Thomas at stetwin.com is my email. Okay, hold on. S-T-H-O-M-A-S at S-T-E-W-I-N. Uh, yep. No, I didn't spell that right. S-T-E-T-W-I-N. Oh, yeah. I missed Okay, dot com. All right, S Thomas at stetwin.com. Okay, I put it in the chat box so that they can find you. Excellent. Um, that's great. And also, before you get to your very last point, I also wanted to tell everybody I'm so excited. Stephanie is running for office. Um, and so tell us, Stephanie, what, just in case there's anybody from Connecticut or your district on the call, what, what, what's going on? Sure. In my spare time, I am running for state representative um, in Connecticut's 143rd district, which is Norwalk, Wilton, Westport. And, 
Um, I'm also switching to a pure virtual campaign. <laughs> so um, if anyone wants to talk about virtual campaigning, <laughs> that is a whole different topic. <laughs> Yay, Stephanie. All right, so go out and vote. That's the message. Go out and vote, everybody. All right, and your last point was going to be, do you even remember it? <laughs> no, of course not. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I think my last point would be, uh, it was, oh, oh, I know. I, I think it was just about, just like, this is the time to try something new, different, um, so many people have not been able to convince their board or executive director to try something new. Like, this is your chance. <laughs> this is your time. Yeah. Um, you can do a lot of fairly low cost things. Like maybe you try soliciting money through some Facebook ads or digital ads that are targeted and like, see what happens. Oh, so, so Liz is reminding us, you were starting to say something about ROI. So what's your return on investment thought? No, I don't remember either. I cut you off, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, make sure it has good ROI, whatever yeah, you're doing. Always, always. <laughs> yes, excellent. Listen, Stephanie, Perfect. thank you so, so much for joining us. Uh, you know what? Over the last three or four months, I mean, I talk about major gifts, but the most popular question is about events. And I just, you know, I don't know what to say. So I'm so, so thrilled. Um, thank you for taking the time to join us. Thank you for having me. Thank you all. So many of you are still listening. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, stayed with us the whole hour. All right, guys, I'll see you next Thursday. Have a great weekend and a great week, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. <laughs>